you know. So <coughs> it's um interesting thing, Gavin Campbell doing these podcasts. They're so easy to do now. I was told I'd never fucking do it. But look at him, fucking iPhone. That's fantastic. And look at that. We're, we're, we're here and we're fucking about to go balls deep, my friend. Is that my jumper? Is it flaring? No, I, no, I think your jumper's fucking great. It's, it's, it's you. Are we on? No, well, yeah, we're, we're on. We're, we're on, but this is the, the teaser. This is the teaser. Teaser. Because I don't have my glasses on, so I can't actually see if that number's turning or whether... Oh, the numbers are turning, mate. The numbers are turning, but uh, we're, we're about to get... Now, that was the dress rehearsal. Now we're getting into the real fucking deal. Right. Okay, okay, so, <laughs> hello there, and welcome to... Melbourne Unreal, where we are mastering music and mastering life. I'm your host, Tony Jack the Bear Manson. We are here at Deluxe Mastering Studios in Melbourne, Australia, the world's most livable fucking city. And um, I'm so fucking happy, so fucking happy that today I've got uh, my dear friend, Kevin Campbell. Give me a hug, fucker. <laughs> For fuck's sake, how long, it's been, how fucking long has it been, dude? Well, since we actually sat in the room together, it could be 20 years. It could be. It could be. Cl- you know what? You could be fucking. We've spoken right. on the phone. Yeah, yeah. But in in terms of actually seeing each other, mm. yeah, it, it's been yeah. Fuck yeah, because I, I think it was actually, you know, you're right. It was doing around the time we did that um, Red Raw Summer Days double compilation, winter, and then, Winter Days Red Raw. Red, winter Days Red Raw, and then we we did that um, wow. Savage Meltdown. Yeah. And um, fucking hell, mate, how the time is flying. I know, I know. And you know, we're both still here. We are. Both still doing things. Absolutely. What a fucking testament. I love that. Melbourne's a town like that. We don't, we hang around. <laughs> well, we, well, we do. But but I think we've got a really good scene in Melbourne. I, I mean, for all, the, for all the stuff that sometimes people can bitch about, this and that, the other, but you know what? It's, it is good. It is healthy. There, underlying all that, there is still love around the place. And oh, totally. It's very family like. You know, the, the, uh, is that corny? No, 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 no. I think you're right. I think you're right. I mean, people may not see each other for years, and I think when people are stuck or people actually need support for something, people come out of the woodwork. They just do. They do, don't they? They just I do. I know that myself. I sometimes rally for people. People do it for me when it, if, if I um, need to call out, they do. They respond, like yourself. So that's cool, yes. And your mate here is pretty cool too. Yeah, he's cool. This fucking dog has been in <laughs> the last few podcasts. This is Zaru. Zaru, he's a beautiful, aren't you, mate? Everyone loves Zaru. He just, uh, he's, I'm his godfather. We're just, we're just taking care of him. Hello. So uh, I, I was saying the other day, because he's been in the last few podcasts, I'm thinking, fuck. Has he? Come yeah, on. just, you know. And I'm thinking, when I have to give him back, he won't be in a certain podcast. People are going to go, what the fuck is this dog? What, where, where's the cast? Yeah, yeah. We don't, we don't give a fuck about you, cunt. We want the dog, you know. <laughs> but, no, they did give a fuck about you, cunt. <laughs> Actually, no, I thought it was fucking hilarious, mate, when, when, I, rang, when I rang you, I said, hello, gorgeous man, you said, hello, you, hello, you gorgeous cunt. <laughs> because I, I, I slavishly followed every second of the Phil K podcast. Yeah. And Johnny Course wrote on Facebook something about, is there a swear jar? Yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm, so, and I'm just thinking, this cunt. <laughs> no, it's good. No, it is, Excuse mate. me. No. No, no, it's absolutely fine. No, well, you know, I, I do cop a bit of shit about it and, you know, some opportunities have been lost because I've been asked to clean up my act, but I, I can't not... It's... Don't go changing. No. <laughs> I, I'm, I... I'm, I'm a little bit similar, actually. Um, I don't... It's not about swearing. It's, I, I sometimes... You know, like, people will be bantering and, and I'll say a couple of extra things that are like, oh, my God, what did he just say? Things like that. Mm. And, you know, I've got to be careful. I've got to be careful. I know that people can be a little bit intimidated by it, not because I'm intimidating, but because I, I can get a bit scary, a bit unpredictable. Yeah, but, <laughs> no, well, but that's who, but that's, but that's, but if that's who you are, I mean, I think that's one of the big lessons in life to learn is that, is that just accept who you are and, yeah. and not get too fucking worried about what other people think about you or the perception of what you think. It's a, this has been a, a this is actually one of the, the things that I struggle with, to be honest. And you actually put up a... I know I mentioned this on the phone, but I'm going to do it again. You said something about... Uh, on this... I think it was about a seven-minute little rant, I'll call it. Mm-hmm. But it was beautiful ranting. Mm. And, um, and it was really good, actually. I thought, cool. It's cool. I'm quite impressed with the way you handle yourself when you're talking to people, actually. And just straight to the camera. 
Oh, oh, thanks, mate. I don't know. I guess I don't know. I guess I've, as I've gotten older and I've realised that you you grow up, you you sort of grow up. Well, you don't. Well, growing up is completely fucking overrated. You never want to grow up. <laughs> I don't want to grow you up. You never want to grow up. If I grow up, up shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know you, you go you go through life with this. Well, at least my experience going through life with this um, idea that you got to make people happy or you got to tiptoe around people or you. you not being yourself because you're not good enough. You don't feel like who you are in your wholeness is something that people won't appreciate or there's always like, okay, well, these guys might dig it. Well, maybe these guys won't. And I'm in an industry where I've really got to be careful. I've got to tiptoe. And and yeah. and it stops you from being your authentic self. Yeah. And therefore, putting the putting your foot in, one foot in front of the other appropriately and making the right choices. You know, I, I, this, is, this is one of the big things for me, you know, I, 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 I certainly don't feel worthy of things. I know I've done things that are interesting or this or that or whatever, but it's a very difficult thing. The other night, will I just go into it? Yeah, of course. I'll just, tell you, yeah, I, I had yeah. the most extraordinary experience on Saturday night. Yeah, tell me about it. Well, I went to the NADOC ball, NADOC being National Aboriginal and Islander Day Organising Committee. So it's the name of the body that, that do it. It's turned into a week all over the country. They do things and... Um, just by um, mutual friends, one of the main organisers of it knew that I was Mr Treaty, you know, doing a remix, that sort of thing. Yeah. So they reached out to me because, as you know, the Aboriginal community are now going to push and trying to rally each other up to push for a, a proper treaty yeah. rather than this recognition bullshit in the Constitution, which doesn't mean... Dick. It doesn't mean jack shit, as, as I heard one of them saying on the radio recently on the ABC. Yeah, and then he went. Oh, excuse me, it was really cute. But anyway, um, so I was invited along, and and it was really cool because I had permission from the Yoffy and Foundation to play the song. You know, one of the new mixes, mm -hmm. and the way they presented it was so cool that hundreds of people were like up chanting, mm -hmm. like it's it's a proper protest thing. And I'm bringing the protest back to the song for 2016. Yeah. Obviously, it's a, it's a good thing to do. But then when the song, when the remix got played, they all ran to the front and they danced and you couldn't even see. It was very similar to the Bugs Bunny cartoon. You know, and, and, they're in, and, and all of a sudden everyone like jumps in the middle and yeah, they yeah, dance yeah, 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 and yeah, then yeah. they all sit down again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, that's like, what it was like. Yeah. And then because they were so excited, the message didn't sink through about um, let's, you know, let's use the song and, and use our struggle and all that. So the chair, NADOC chair, said to me, Gavin, you're going to have to get up and explain it. And I'm like, what the fuck? Mm. You know, like it's just this gala ball. Everybody's important. And I'm sitting there not knowing anyone at this table, yeah. eating my dinner quietly. Next thing you know, I've got to get up. Yeah. So I can't remember why I brought that up now. It's, oh, I felt totally like, what, me? But who else is going to do it? Yeah. Who else did that? So it's kind of, I know, I... I my dear friend Chris Sader, who's a, a bit of a journalist as well, he's a writer, he wrote something about me a few years ago in the gay media and said, Campbell's an interesting combination of ego and self-doubt. <laughs> 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 but I just thought, fuck, Sam Dunk, beautiful. Yeah. I am. It's weird. You do have to believe in yourself, don't you? Yeah. But, I mean, so <laughs> I, I don't know if you could ever fully get rid of self-doubt, though. I, I think there's always going to be moments, but... I think in my case now, when if I have experienced that or something comes in my head, I just I've just had a bit more awareness now to stop and just go, Whoa, hang on a minute, where what was that? Where'd that come from? You know, it's bullshit and and, and then move on. Whereas before, up until in all honesty, Gavin, I reckon probably until about maybe a year ago, it was just this fucking program where it was just I was just running blindly to Yeah. You know, and, and everything else that I put out there was just a front. It was just this it was bullshit. I'm still a bit in that. Not, I'm not. I'm not a dishonest person or anything, but I'm still stuck in the self doubt. Yeah. I, I. I don't know. I think. Um, I don't know. I don't know what it is. <laughs> no, no. Well, 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 well no, 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 no. I think. I think. I think. What it. What it is is just more of a program that's been set. Yeah. And, and we're, yeah. we're we're bombarded with so much fucking negativity and so much false media. I mean, the world. I mean, I, I'm not. Look, I'm not a fucking conspiracy theorist per se, or, but but That's I good. do, but I do, 
I, but I do believe, though, that the way fucking media works is really by... They don't want you to be happy and self-fulfilled because then you've got no need to buy this <laughs> fucking product yeah. for your hair. No, I hear. You don't have to wear these fucking shoes. Yeah. You don't have to have this thing or drive this car in order to feel like you're fucking good enough to go out in the world and fucking tell the world, hey, look at me. You know what's interesting? You've just made me... I knew this anyway, but you've just brought this to my fore. It's almost like the... Per, the <sighs> My like my my wage definitely doesn't reflect my ability as a DJ yeah. and my um, my opportunities, you know. And it's all like it's just I, I, I yeah I, I know I'm not a sham, but I almost can feel like should I be going on about all this shit? Yeah, no, 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 no absolutely. <laughs> We're having our honest conversation. It's man. just difficult, you and know. It doesn't matter. I, I guess this is probably good for anyone who's watching this. Absolutely. That's trying to start out or this or that or the other. It's, it's always a struggle to um. You know, to to stay focused on you know your creativity and and believe in yourself and all that kind of stuff. I'm almost fifty six years old. I've done some you know things that people think, oh, you're you're a legend. But you know, I think it's just that legend thing because you've been around long enough. You end up with that title. I don't know, but I don't think it's just. I don't think. Look, you know what? I don't think it's. You just don't become a legend by being around. I mean, okay, that that still is something to be able to do your your job for many years. But if we look back to what you've done, I mean, you've got a label. You've created some of the best fucking parties and nights in the history of fucking dance music. So you've written your. Ch you know, someone's gonna. Someone was gonna write a book about the history of Australian club culture. There'd have to be a fucking chapter fucking marked out to you in the part, you know. I mean, Tasty, mate. Come on, for fuck's sake. Tasty was a ball. Come on, Fuck, that tell was, me. That was, that was such a hoot. It was... It, it, the raid wasn't because it was so good or a conspiracy shut it down, but it was so... such a... Um, oh, an anomaly. Absolutely. An anomaly, mm. really. Um, that um, it, it didn't... It had... It imploded... The raid was, was outside forces, but I think we attracted it. And you fought it, Not mate. the gays. No, no. The, 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 the misadventure that went on week after yeah, week. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, absolutely. And, and, you know, someone fucking did a documentary about it. I'm sure people would just go, bullshit. Bull did you know there is a documentary? No. There's a documentary. It's a poor excuse for um, telling that tale. It really is. Um, in what in what respect it wasn't accurate or no no it well, wasn't well it wasn't well done in terms of the the technicality or the creative aspect I think, of it or? I think they got overly creative and really really um, twee with it. What they did was I, when I heard about it being made, I thought these people were from Sydney, nice people, mind you, very nice people, but just not. The taste it was very very kind of cheeky, subversive, underground. Wild, untamed, yeah. and and a very specific type of um, thing occurred there mm -hmm. week in week out, and I knew that no nobody's going to be able to tell that story. You know, it's all going to be clinical yeah. because of the the, the technical, the political aspect. So and and I was right. And so I didn't appear in. The, I refused to appear in it, um, but I gave them some footage that my sister had shot over various weeks. And what happens is halfway through the documentary. They start to follow, they're following individuals that were there that were affected, but there's all these dramatizations and just this twee stuff. And, and I just thought it was too long, boring. But um, there is a girl actually who's studying at the moment and she's, she's making a, a dramatization of it. And I'm, I'm quite supportive of her because she's, got, she's really edgy. She has a, um, a gay night that's quite successful. She's gay herself, you know, everything's. Everything's cool, so I'm, I'm what supportive not, can, of that. Can you tell us what not that is? Thursdays. Right. Thursdays, which is in uh, Fitzroy on mm -hmm. Thursday nights. Mm -hmm. Her name is Megan Palmer. Mm -hmm. Lovely girl. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> so, and, and you've, uh, so your latest, so Poof Doof is your latest thing? Not really. Poof Doof was something that, <clears throat> I don't, I'm not involved with Poof Doof anymore. Oh, okay. I was. Did you, <clears throat> did you, did, did you instigate that or did you create that? Well, or were you just part of something that's part was, of it? I was approached by a really cool man named Michael Delaney um, about six months before he opened up the bottom end, which was where Survivor was, the club Survivor, and Poof Doof was on the top. And, but but we he opened it. I was DJing on Sunday nights downstairs at Bottom End, and he told me all along he wanted to do a gay night on the 
top floor. And I was like, oh, you're kidding. That's like, that's a tall order. Um, <clears throat> and sure enough, we, we pulled it together. He had his mate, Anthony Hocking, who he brought in as well. So there was Hockers, Delaney and myself, and we did, we did instigate, yeah, and, and create it together. I was the musical director and the main DJ. I was actually just there to help and um, help give it a bit of credibility because the gay community know me very well and they know that I do alternative style clubs. So, you know, mm -hmm. and, and the music's good. So, and that's what these people are on about. Michael Delaney's a very cl classy um, um, oddball. Yeah. But really good. Yeah. Really good. Yeah. And um, so I said to them, look, I wa I've been wanting to do a Saturday night dance floor for a number of years again. So I said, I'm going to go and do that on my own unless you let me be the musical director of this. I want yeah. to do this properly and I'll throw it all in. So I did. And I, it took a couple of weeks to figure out what to play these kids. But once, what, after two weeks, it was great. And, and the place just, it was, it's one of the best things I've ever been involved with. Mm. Fantastic club. And we managed to drag people into the city, which hadn't, to my mind, because it was not in vogue at all, that sort of thing, and, and Commercial Road was, was quite defunct by that point. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the last time I remember being able to drag, or anybody being able to drag that underground um, frivolity back into the CBD was Savage years ago in, in 93. Yeah, well, that was another fucking seminal fucking piece of work of yours. Yeah. <laughs> well, Savage, Savage was great because I, I think it was our first super club. Yeah. It was such a large scale and it was in the city. It was and very upfront and DJs, all the best DJs were playing there. You know, in fact, that it was cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can go on. I could. Yeah. How do you think about, what, so how do you find the game scene these days as compared to, because for me, I, I'm my first entry into it all was in the 90s and one thing i always loved about it, going to any gay club was obviously the music you always if, if you went to the right place you always were guaranteed a, a fantastic fucking and and the djs were great and the vibe was good and it was friendly as fuck and 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 you know contrary to what other people would have thought it was actually i found to be very inclusive i think so long as your attitude oh, yeah. if your attitude was right then, which is just, hey, we're just here to have a good time. Yeah. You know, there's no, no, no dick swing. Well, there was dick swing. But, but, no, but you know, you, you just were there to have a good time. And, and that was it. And That's what gay clubs are about. It's, it's about being silly. It's about just letting... It's, I, I, I hate the cliche, a safe place, safe space. Yeah. But it was, obviously. No, well, it had to be. You know, um, that, that particular thing has come up a lot since Orlando. But... Um, yeah, no, gay clubs are great. Everybody knows gays party hard. Drugs are ra rife, rampant. They're rife. Yeah. And um, drugs make it the club in many cases, but they can also ruin a club. Um, you know. Depends. I think it depends. I think, I think it depends on drugs. I think, I, <laughs> I mean, there's a theory. People say that back in the day the drugs were better. I don't know whether they were better or, or, or not, but I think being a club and fucking being on MDMA and there's just something about fucking MDMA that just works. Can I just say, I'm not condoning drugs or anything, but I've... I, I am. No. <laughs> it is no <laughs> secret kidding. I have a black belt. You turn the heat back. You go. You go, you go on. I've yeah. got a black belt in drug abuse, you know? <laughs> uh, I'm, ve I'm clean these days. I'm, I'm an adult again. Well, for the first time, actually. But, but uh, all right, I've got, here's a confession. I went to Bergheim a couple of years ago, and um, we found some MDMA in... in MDA in, in the toilets there. So we didn't find it. How, un some, how unfortunate some, for you, Gavin Campbell. Someone gave it to us and I was on the dance floor for 12 hours. Yeah. 12 hours. I didn't go into the back rooms. I just stayed on the dance floor. Well, it was great. This is, um, I apologise to any of, say, my mother's old friends that might be watching this. Yeah. <laughs> but that's a funny thing. It's a funny thing about drugs. It's, it's like my, my life changed dramatically as a result of um, DMT, which is fucking, you know, class one drug, illegal as fuck, and nobody wants, you know, nobody wants you to have it. But because of this powerful fucking psychedelic man, it just completely re, it just deconstructed and fucking reconstructed me. MDMA, I think, and MDMA and weed, I think, are two wonderful fucking drugs that, again, as long as you don't abuse it, you know, expand your fucking consciousness. It has more of an, unlike alcohol, 
has a more inclusive kind of vibe that goes to it. Alcohol and heroin are similar in the way they they eat away from the inside, I think. Uh, uh, Yeah, you know, um, yeah, um, I'm pretty clean these days. So uh, that's why I'm freely talking about it now. If I was still involved in drugs, I wouldn't be discussing it because Mm. it's a bit... Bit, not hypocritical. That, I don't give a fuck about being hypocritical. Um, all I'm saying is, it's um, easier, perhaps. Easier. To talk about it in yeah. a in a more honest way. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I, I like to be honest. I don't want to. Um, it's a, yeah. be pretending. Yeah, but yeah. honesty is hard, dude. Let's face it. Being being. <laughs> yes. It it's is. hard. No, it's it hard. Is. Like people people love the notion of honesty. People love the notion of being real and authentic, but. Fuck, mate, what's the hardest thing? To, the hardest person to be honest with, first of all, is yourself. Yeah. We, we, yeah. we spend a life fucking yeah. kidding ourselves so often and being in this delusional fucking state of everything's okay or where I, you know, and it's always about other people rather than fucking being introspective in yourself and just going, hang on a minute. Because when you're being honest with yourself, it's fucking hard, dude. It is. It's it is. fucking hard. The truth is, it, yeah. It's very hard to handle the truth. I do believe that it's the only thing that matters and everything else is just fluff. You know, and, and so you try, to, you try to live an honest life. But um, I've, I'm still going through things. I'm still coming out the other end of all of it, you know. And I'm finding that we've been quite busy with the record label lately and um, I've just started DJing. Well, you see, I... I, I <laughs> Can I just go back to Bergheim? Yeah, please. When yeah. I went to Berlin, like I've I've DJed for thirty two years now, and, and you starting getting the hang of it now? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I, I'm not so nervous about me. Do you know what? When some fucker comes in who's really technically brilliant. Yeah. When I say fucker, I just it's a bit yeah, of jealousy. Know. Yeah, yeah, you know, like sure. Phil K comes into your DJ booth. Yeah, yeah right. And all of a sudden <laughs> yeah. you turn to mush and everything yeah. goes wrong. Do you know what he did to me once at Puffdorf? He, he said to me. I'll just give you a little tip, and he told me about the, the equation that you do. I think it's multiples of four? Yeah. Or something. Yeah. And so when you're too drunk, he said, and I'm yeah. like, he's bullshitting me. He's never too drunk to mix. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so I started doing these mathematics. Yeah. And lo and behold, every mix worked. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, whoo. <laughs> but I've forgotten the equation because I'm no good at maths. Yeah. Anyway, um, what was I going to say? You were so, Berlin. You were fucking... Okay. Yeah, I can't remember why I just got into that mixing thing then. My mind just, it goes... It's fine. All over the place. That's fine. But, um, so, over the years, as the different genres are birthed, um, you know, because I was playing before house music was invented. So, when that all came along, you know, there was the, the earlier forms of house. So, at Razor... Hang on, we haven't gone back to Bergheim. The, the, the yeah, end of I am. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. I am. You're doing the scenic route. Okay, uh, forgive me. Go on. There's method on. to my madness. Of course. Go <laughs> on. <laughs> I, I grabbed onto all the the good bits of genres, and so over the years I can play quite eclectic sets. So I've found that techno um, of late, everyone goes on about techno being great. It is. It's magic. But I, 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 I used to be the sort of DJ that I could never settle on a genre. I could never decide, okay, this is the sort of DJ I want to be and, and do it. Like when we had Uranus, I'd play for five hours just so that I could use the whole spectrum, mm-hmm. you know? But isn't that the whole idea, though, of playing oh, a DJ set? Oh, I, I, I do believe that. Yes, I do believe that. But who gives you? Who gives you more than 90 minutes, two hours? It's, it's hard to get that. They fucking you know? give you... Like, sometimes I see fucking these festivals or parties and there's like fucking 100 DJs on yeah, over the course of a night. it's bullshit. It's fucking bullshit. How that. does that work? I, somebody said to me the other day, oh, I'll, I'll just go back to Bergheim. At 55 years old, a, a DJ of repute, it changed my life. It made me confident. Obviously, it was the, the word on, on what techno is and how it can be presented and, and felt and all that so I, I actually do techno now that's if you want to book me for a club I'll, I'll you know like I wouldn't play at Puff Puff anymore because it's I know they're they're delving into it as well but I would just want to I'm not going to do Gaga remixes for the young guys anymore no so um I think that's what I was going to say about Bergheim you know it's, it's kind of um focused me a little bit on that which is Quite refreshing and a bit a bit of a relief. I haven't bought a deep house song in three years, and um, 
hardly any house, a house that will fit into my techno sets. Mm. And I'm, I'm not the best techno DJ, but I do know how to present it, so that's okay. It's not anyway. what matters. I mean, really, at the end of the day, I mean, so, DJs sometimes get so caught up in the technical aspects of it in terms of, yes, it's, it's wonderful to hear a DJ mix well and, and not hear like a fucking train wreck and, and key, but if, if you, personally, I would rather hear a DJ that programs a set really well will read a floor really well and play appropriately in the moment for a fucking in the night rather than, you know, a, per, a flawless technical set that has no soul, yeah. that has no fucking vibe, that is purely about just, a, it's a selfish kind of thing, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Uh, and those guys that can get that, both of them pulling together, now that's magic. I know that I can do that at times, but I, I find that, Programming is absolutely everything, you know. If there's, there's the top ten things for a DJ set, programming, 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 yeah, programming. Yeah, you know, like yeah. location, location. Yeah. It's programming. That's it. And um, and of course, programming is um, there's a few things involved in it. And reading the crowd is is everyone knows you have to read the crowd and stuff, but but n not everybody does it. Does it? Yeah. Not everybody does it. And and some people probably get a bit misguided with it thinking you know it's particularly hard i'll go back to when when there's djs hanging around the booth and stuff you tend to play for them and that god i, I hope i never do that again i yeah. hope i never do that again fuck the dj yeah just get and dance stop looking <laughs> yeah yeah but i guess that's that, again that comes down to the part of like you want to be you you want to feel validated don't you by, you and, do and, you do, and, you do, and yes. it, especially by your peers because it's your peers that go out and talk about you as well as the punters but but your peers especially and you within your group that's exactly right it's what the djs it's where they put you that's where your position is that's that's exactly where your worth is and all that and and, and you know for me it's funny I, I i don't think i ever would have had the balls to go hey i'm doing techno now guys because you know they just laugh but i i just do it and and it works and and i know that i i'm very good at it actually like i getting gigs and stuff. Someone said to me the other day, oh, well, your set the other night was amazing. And it was, it was just pure techno, I loved it. Yeah. And they said, do you want to play this night we're opening? Do you, do you want 10 to 11? Or was it 11 to 12 or 12 to one? And I said, I want 11 to one, thanks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so I got it, but, which is great. Am I sounding like I'm bragging now? No, no, not at all. <laughs> and, and, and you know what? And if someone's watching this right now, hang on, Gavin, here's the thing about growing up and fucking coming comfortable. If someone decides that you're being fucking bragging, fuck, fuck them. you, fuck <laughs> you. I like, That's their own problem. I like to. I'm. I'm trying to own things. You know. Well, you have to. You got to toot your own horn a little bit, mate. Because again, if you if you can't fucking if you can't own it and know it to be true, no other cunt's gonna fucking buy into it either. Well, you know what I did do. My manager Erin, bless her, she said to me on Sunday morning because I had a little photo that, so, that someone in the crowd sent me mm -hmm. of me up, up talking to all the, the community mm. on Saturday night and it was such a huge moment. I had to show Erin and she said, no, you post that in the morning. So I did and I boosted it. Yeah. I actually paid because that's, this is like, I don't know. It's something that not many DJs get to actually That's so true. Um, own. And why shouldn't you fucking, fucking, I mean, it, I think it just goes to show that, you know, DJs aren't just fucking some, they're just, one kind of person that, and they're dumb cunts so they're just all drug takers a lot of DJs are really intelligent <laughs> no, no, used to be there's a little there's, there's, there's got to be a little bit of that but I mean Sorry, but, 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 go on. but no but there's a lot of fucking DJs who are fucking really savvy and smart and, yeah. and they're doing great things I mean look at fucking Andy Van and John Course for example uh, I take my hat off to them I love John Course I love Andy too. I haven't seen Andy for many, many years. Yeah. I spoke to Andy the other day. He's gonna. I'm hoping I'll get him on Is the podcast. Come in? Oh, I'm hoping. I'm, well, he he got back to me and he responded. So he's got a sh sh he's got shit on the go right now. But he um, the impression is that he probably. I'm hoping that he will. You know, I'm hoping that it will. And it'd be great because what a fucking story those guys are. I know that's fantastic. And they're DJs. DJs. Yeah. Businessmen. But but what, what you know? I I mentioned Johnny. I, I was thinking that because I've worked with John a bit over the last five years, mm -hmm. you know, more than I ever did before. Mm -hmm. Our paths didn't cross that much as mm -hmm. DJs mm -hmm. in the booth, mm -hmm. but we, we were paired together at Poofdorf a lot. I, I actually asked them, I don't know if you know this, John, but if you're looking, watching, but I actually asked them repeatedly, please bring John Cross mm -hmm. in, um, because I wanted some serious DJs, you know, yeah. and, and, and to... Uh, <laughs> I'll probably get in trouble with this, but the kids used to think that it was underground. 
puffed off. Mm. But it wasn't. Mm. It was just the, the way I programmed it, it gave that, it was different to yeah. the other gay clubs. And I, I wanted, I knew that John would, would be able to really, like, tell them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Just by being... Absolutely. Himself. I mean, he. Could, I mean, that guy could walk into any fucking room, and he could he could pull a set out of his ass like that. Where he yeah. could play hip hop set, a house set, a techno set, a progressive set. I mean, he's one of those one of those DJs that could just pull it out and w- and seemingly with no effort. You know, yeah. I was a judge years ago. I think it was 80, 88. Was this a DMC? Did um, you know this? Have I told I you? Had, this? No, no. Yes. No. I was a judge on the DMC mixing panel competition panel mm. and this kid from Frankston comes along and just you know he was, he was only what 15 or 16 or I, I can't he, remember he was, a kid. he was under he under was, age he was a kid it was a daytime at Zuzu's nightclub yeah and um and I was in the middle of the judging panel there's about five of us <clears throat> and when he finished I just like I sat back and I thought it was like a scrum yeah. and I just said guys this is a 10 out of 10 and I, I'm not I wasn't Telling them what to vote, but I'm giving this kind of a ten out of ten. This yeah, is amazing. Yeah. yeah, and they all did. He yeah. got perfect score. Yeah, because it wasn't just his ability with his tricks; it was actually the the, the, the music. Yeah. Anyway, he got enough. We've talked about him enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that with some people, how they have, some people though. It's interesting that you they. I, I believe at the end of the day, you got to work, right? You, mm-hmm. Unless you put effort and discipline into your craft, you won't get good. But I still believe that there are some people that have this natural affinity. There's just something there yeah. that he's one of them. Yeah, that practice alone is not isn't going to get you to. There's just that indef- <laughs> no, indefinable thing. Like for example, when you see Prince <clears throat> playing or dancing, and you just go, "Wow, that's just that's 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 the biz." John's a bit like that with his with his um, handwork on the mixer. Um, Stephen Hawkins from Sydney's another one. I, I, he's the only DJ I would ever say, particularly through the first 20 years, the formative years, where you're still trying to learn everything or, and experiencing it all. And, and I'd, I'd witnessed Stephen Hawkins DJing and his use with the crossfader. He would almost just grab what he wanted out of two songs that were playing at once. Mm. And I'd be like, oh my God, that's amazing. Mm. And then I started to experiment a little bit with EQ and all that. Mm. And now it's a big thing. You know, it's, that's what they do and that's all the effects. But... um. Yeah, anyway, I don't know what I was going to say next. Yeah. I get lost in it. That's all, well, don't we all? It's all good. It's magic. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay, let me, let me give you a scenario, right? Yeah. You, you're going to put on a fucking party, a 24-hour party, right? Now, who would you, like, who would be some of your definite top five guys that you'd fucking want to have playing on this party? Australian? Australian for now. Let's just stick yeah. this because if it's international, you'd have to fucking have it for a week, right? <laughs> Almost a week. <clears throat> but let's just say in Australia, yeah, in Australia, you're doing a twenty-four hour party. Who? Give me five guys that you, that you would just fucking have to have there, iris, regardless. Well, obviously the three that I've already named yet: Phil K, Johnny Course, and Stephen Hawkins. Mm-hmm. Can be and Shetty, who's a Latin art tough guy, HMC. Mm-hmm. Yeah, HMC. Yeah. So I should just say HMC. Mm-hmm. Um, ooh, let me think. Guy Upaya? Um Can I tell you something about Guy Upaya? Why? Right. Now, I've seen a lot of DJs play. I've experienced lots of amazing fucking moments listening to DJs. But can I tell you, the one fucking DJ set that stands out for me and still to this day does was seeing Guy Upaya play the back room at Redhead. He played this fucking deep house and vocal house fucking set that I still get a hard on over. He... He... It what fucking I, what blew my fucking mind, yeah. Gavin Campbell. He, he, when I say that there's not that many that have influenced me, I, I, oh, I, I kind of tell a lie. Guy, guy did. The guy used to be the person, my go-to man at Central Station for years. Yeah. Him and Jim Kay and Maury. Well, all of them really. Yeah. But guy, guy would have the bag. Yeah. Oh, he'd go, oh, you wait till you hear this. <laughs> and I'd walk in. And we, I had dinner with him and the Central Station staff and John Morgan just, just a few nights ago. Yeah. Because they're doing 40th anniversary, right? 40th anniversary. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's so a book coming out about Joe's career yeah. as a trailblazer and a lawbreaker. <laughs> lawbreaker. <laughs> no, he, you know. He was a maverick. He was. He was, he was, a, straight, he was a straight up mad yeah. cunt. That's yeah. not, that's, oh, that's, that's he, not he his He still words. is. He still is. But um, I got to know Joe and Morgan on a deeper level in the last 10 years. My mother was um, adored by both of them because... We used to visit them in Queensland and, and go and have lunch and stuff because yeah. they all got on well. But um, 
back to Guy. Guy, see, back in the Razor days, Razor was, a, a, it went for six years. It, it is considered to be the beginning of, you know, the true underground. You know, it's, it's where it was born and, and nurtured. Mm -hmm. But we only had five DJs over that whole period, mm -hmm. just five DJs. And two of them, I, one of them I pulled from the bar. Yeah. I taught them, all except for Guy. Guy didn't need teaching. Yeah. Um, because it, I always felt that in all of the clubs I ever did, one song wrong, one foot wrong, mm. and it, and it's not what it is, what it should be, yeah. which is um, a revelation. Yeah. You know, and um, so that's consistency is is why you know for sixteen years we were the influential dance floors, and um, Guy was my my um, my authenticity, you know, the blackness. Mm. in his sound and his appreciation and yeah years 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 ahead in terms of his understanding of what what we're listening to and what was great was we had a great friendship relationship with the whole thing because at Razor <clears throat> say on the Friday I could go in and hang out for a few hours with Guy and come out with 20 records those 20 records would all be programmed properly that much wow. I didn't have to mm. figure out get them used to it yeah you know it, that's what razor was that's underground that yeah it was really amazing and then and so guy would play before me and um i'd usually play like from uh maybe three three thirty in the morning till seven or seven thirty but guy in incredible so did, did i rave on too much about him then no waste too much time how much no. time have we got is there something All better the to talk about no 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 we, we got we got we got it we got we got we got heaps of time see my crisis of confidence it always pops up even when no. i'm talking about something as amazing as, as that but it's but it's true and it's good and that's why you're here because you've got a great story man you've got, <laughs> you got a great fucking story and uh, what you've achieved in fucking dance music uh, like i said i don't think there's a lot of people that would fucking come close to what you've done so far. Well, it's and you should be fucking mm, proud of it. Oh, I'm very proud of that. I know, I know what we've done. You see, this is the this is the cool thing about being the the man with the clubs, the man with the label, and and the DJ as well at the same time. It was a long time before someone else came along to actually DJ at their own events, clubs. Yeah. Richie Rich was doing it. Mark James was doing it with their parties. Yeah. But they were like every few months they'd do that. Yeah. Put put themselves on the bill. Yeah. This was this was like a career kind of thing that, for that I know is is why I need to hold my head up high. Yeah. I know that, but um, um, I can't remember the point I was going to make. Yeah. Don't do drugs. Your memory goes. <laughs> <laughs> It's probably because I'm over 50 as well. Oh, bullshit. I don't buy that. I know. I'm I like, don't. You I, know what? It's I, a... I flog myself. <laughs> Mia culpa. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. I, I don't know about you, Gavin Campbell, but I love... I'm fi I just turned 53. I love being 53. I have no desire. People say, oh, youth is wasted on the young. I have no desire no, you, to go fuck back. Fuck you. I've got no desire yeah. to ever want to go back to fucking my 20s <laughs> or my 30s. Yeah. They can eat a dick. I'm so I, fucking happy. I, I, look, I, I'm similar. I, I actually, I just love this sense of knowing. Yeah. You, you know things. I know there's a lot of self-doubt in there too, but I actually have a, a real sense of, I can see, you, you see through things. Totally. Especially when you're in a club these days. I might I might point out that I, I'm, I've got this new gig monthly at Toff in town on Sunday nights, and they're outrageous. They're wild and creative, these young ones. And they're, yeah. they're, um, they're just a bunch of show-offs, but fuck, they've just really dragged me into the bosom of their heart, so to speak, mm. and they're getting the best techno sets out of me mm. and stuff like that. So um, when I say fuck the youth, I don't really mean that in a no, sense. No, 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 I understand. When, when we gel, when the ages come together, um, and this is what, I had, used to have uh, issues with the main guy, Levi, Levi, who's, you know, I, I could almost worship him now. I've, I've, I finally like I've had an epiphany mm. with with who I'm dealing with, mm. and and he's brilliant and he's just inspiring all these other people and stuff. But he actually said to me just after the first set I did there, which was quite a killer. Um, they loved it, and and Levi said to me, "Now don't take this the wrong way, but we wanted an older DJ." And I'm like, oh, "You're saying it in the right context here. Yeah. Thank you, thank yeah. you, thank you." <laughs> Because I, 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 you know, ageism is fuck. 
fuck that. Everybody stamp out ageism. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I think also in, in, in terms of us older guys, veterans, call us what you will, I think that we, we really have a responsibility and an obligation to pass on knowledge and to help kids because the kids who want to listen, and there's plenty of those around, Gavin Campbell. There is, there is. There's there is, plenty yeah. of those. And, and I don't think they, if anything, I think these kids look at us and they don't look at age as in, yes, okay, we're old uh, in a numbers sense, but I really think they really do look up and respect us and, and they want to, in the same, you know, when we, you and I were coming up in our own respective fields, there wasn't as many people to learn from. And, and most of it, you have to kind of work out yourself. We did. We did. For the most part. That, that's actually, that's why it hurts when, the, when they when they don't understand who you are and, and, and where you fit in. I'm not saying I need to be, you know... Put on a pedestal on, or... Yeah, yeah. patted on the back. That's bullshit. It doesn't work for me. Yeah. It never has. No. It's an empty feeling, actually. But, um, yeah... Just... And, and, you'll never get, and you'll never get it. <laughs> no. It's like that fucking <laughs> metaphor one of my mentors, Peter Sage, talks about the white rabbit. It's like dogs chasing a rabbit. The game is set up so they never get the fucking kind of a thing. Yeah. But yeah. they're always happy running. They never, yeah. they never come back one week and say, "Fuck you! I've never caught the kind of thing. I'm not going to run this week. Fuck you!" You know what I mean? Well, that's interesting. So I'm, I'm, I'm one of those dogs. Yeah, I'm the rabbit. Well, you have to be. You can't, <laughs> no, you can't not be. You can't not be one of those fucking greyhounds and be doing it for fucking, you know, longer than some of these kids you're fucking mentoring have been alive. Well, yeah. You know, um, speak. Yeah, uh, I, I had a flash of something to say when you talked about. There wasn't anybody. There really wasn't. No. I had I had Joe at Central Station. He actually, uh, he took shining to me. As soon as I walked in the shop in 1982, he took a bit of a shining to me and he would personally deal with me. This is before Guy got to the shop, mm -hmm. a few years before. And, and so, you know, the first time I bought records for a set, he pulled out from under their white um, horse laid back. Mm -hmm. And it's still one of the most advanced yeah, pieces of music I've ever heard, and it still blows people's minds, you know. And that was the very first time I bought music for a set. Yeah. So I had that. I, so it was good, but I didn't have people to. Oh, actually, I would stand there watching them beat mix, and I would think that it was kind of otherworldly. I think what the hell is yeah, going on yeah, here? Yeah. But why I brought all that up was because um, I, I knew what they were doing. Actually, because <laughs> my very first gig, I got the venue manager to call the technician, because there was something wrong with my turntable. Yeah, right. And I'm like, oh, and he came all the way in from miles away. 45 minutes it took him to get there, and he came straight away. And do you know what he did? He got the pitch control and he moved it back <laughs> into the centre. <laughs> that's what he did. And I'm like, that's why my songs were all slow. Yeah. Because the pitch control. Oh, was down yeah. wherever. No one to tell me. <laughs> I, I love that story. I like to tell it. <laughs> But there's something. But there's something in that, isn't it? Your, your, your greatest lessons are usually the ones where you just you, you just seem like you're a complete dickhead, like, <laughs> and it's it's just embarrassing. But but then you can own and say, yes, that was me. Yeah, that <laughs> yeah. was me. We don't have sync buttons <laughs> in this day and age. We we where are you with all that shit with technology? You know, it, like where it's evolved. It doesn't bother me at all. It doesn't bother me at all. It bothers me not to be to have the phone not ringing. And if I go out clubbing, which I don't, I don't want to, um, I go out to a gig and I might stay and have a drink and stuff afterwards, but I will, won't go out clubbing. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm not bothered by it. I, 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 oh, you know, I do know that there are some superstars out there and then you, there's your obvious models and drag queen DJs, things like that, that are just pushing sync buttons or it's all pre-programmed or little iPods in their jewelry, you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't bother me at all. It really doesn't bother me. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll quote Phil Kay. He, he just said to me, it, it's a function. It's, it's there. It's just that it's abused, you know? Yeah. And, um, and what, what makes me embarrassed is I saw an ad the other day on TV and it's like some 10-year-old. Oh, I'm a DJ and I'm a music producer. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm never going to say I'm a <laughs> DJ or a fucking producer again. I just thought, is this what we've been reduced to? Good on you, 10-year-old, whoever you are. That's fucking fantastic that you can do that. It's really cool. What a world. But 
But, you know, I'm, you're ruining I'm, it for us. I'm amazed, I'm amazed that mainstream fucking TV would even have an ad that would even recognise DJs or producers. Yeah, yes. It's, a, it's an ad about breakfast cereal. And where the fuck does that come in? I don't it? know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. What's, what's the connection for fuck's sake? I don't know. I don't know. It's just that he's a kid and he's, he's vibrant and he's, you know, he's... Anyway, um, that's, that seems like a bitch. I'm being ageist. Am I being ageist? I, I, is, it, is it about the fact that he's 10 or is it about the fact that he's a 10-year-old can't fucking... You don't really have the right of 10 to be able to call yourself something that you haven't had the time <laughs> oh, to put in. Oh, you are so right. You wise thing, yeah. Because, you know, sometimes I just get, and I don't process the proper ins and outs of why I'm feeling that way. Yeah. Thank but, you for helping me there. That's no, okay. But no, but, but I mean, look, you can call yourself what the fuck you want, but, you know, people, people don't really understand DJing. And I think most of the mainstream that will watch that ad would, don't, I don't think really, I mean, they would just see DJing as this fucking mindless fucking hobby of just the kids do now yeah you, you, you know <laughs> but but, in, but really i mean but it's funny now it's funny how it's evolved from when you started back in the day when i started uh, djs were just djs and it wasn't really until the 90s that we saw the emergence of the superstar dj yes, yes. And sasha, who, sasha like digweed that. dave seaman john please women the drag dj yeah. forgotten legend you know and the like and then you, and who who would have thunk Seriously, that in 19 fucking 92 or 3 when, you know, all this shit was emerging, prog house is emerging, that we would see DJs fucking in Las Vegas pulling 100 grand a gig. That, that... Honestly. I, I love that whole thing as well. I was in Vegas in 2007, just after all the chefs were brought into the area and the design of the bars and the clubs was extraordinary. Mm. And I remember saying, I was with my mother, and I remember saying, Mum, fuck, I, I should um, get some tapes together and, and you know, some mixes together, because I could come here and I could blow people away with these facilities, and, and what, a, what an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. But um, <clears throat> what, what really bugs the fucking shit out of me is that you get people like David Guetta with that fucking shit sound. Sorry, I've, I, you can see I'm getting a little bit angry about it just thinking about it and they they they're like that's what that's the face of dance music to the world mm -hmm. you know though the the big things that stand out like that and they make a fortune calvin harris is a little bit better well he's much better i i, I don't mind that it's maybe it's just my musical taste i don't know but it's a travesty that um i don't know maybe i'm just saying that because it's not me <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I mean, I mean, I mean, how? I mean, how'd you feel though if that was you? I mean, would you, would you honestly I, fucking I play? Know. Would you honestly play that sort of shit? No, no, not that sort of stuff. But, but, but in but in order to be there, you you, you gotta you gotta you gotta play, do that. You gotta play to the, the, the crowd because yes. that's the demand. That's what they want. You've got to rape yourself. You rape, know, rape your whole. I'll tell you ability. I'll tell you a fucking funny story. Person I introduced you to, Guy Oliver, aka Oli uh, Guy, uh, sorry, um, Gab, Gab, Olivia. How is he? Fucking great. I saw him at uh, Slimo a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. He was, it was fucking awesome. He's, uh, he's fucking building a studio and making tunes, and he's, he's doing his thing. He's, he's great. I remember him being on the phone back at DMC Records, mm -hmm. talking to Anthony Papa, yeah. who Anthony went overseas and fucking set trailblaze. What right? a legend! Yeah. Fucking total legend. Right? Without music. He did that before he was producing. Yes. You know? Absolutely. Which is the biz. Absolutely. And so he went over there, he, he hooked up with Seaman and all the boys, as it were, and he um, and he hooked up a fucking gig for for um for him. And and he said, um but now I only heard one end of the conversation, but I remember um that Gab was just saying, Papa, listen. Fucking tell those fucking cats I won't be playing no fucking cheese, mate. No cheese, you understand? I only play fucking tunes. I don't give a fuck, mate. I don't care how much those cats are going to pay me. I only want to hear fucking tunes, papa. You understand? Deep and underground. You understand? That's it. So, but he's talking to papa. He's talking, yeah. You yeah. so what? Sorry. What? <laughs> but but you know there's a guy he's, he's I mean he's got integrity I mean he, he walked he walked yeah, his talk no, but no. I don't know I, I think I think at some point you got to be look I respect anyone that will be 
staunch in that respect and they will stick to their guns no matter what. But I think the guys who have become more successful, and by successful I mean manage to make a living or be able to create more money for themselves and, and create their branding and, and branch off from there, where again, look at fucking John Course, you know? Now, now John could have fucking said himself, you know what, fuck you, I'm not going to play that or I won't be playing that. And another great example, Ivan Goff. Right? Yep. Ivan yep. Goff was a guy who just said, you know what, back in the day when it was all about progressive shit and he just said, you know what, I'm over it, Tony. Like fucking, I'm just going to go and I'm going to do my nights at this club and I'm going to play what the fuck they want and I'm going to use that and make some money and enjoy myself doing that. That's going to help subsidise my art. Yes. You see, I like that approach too. I actually like that. You know? It's smart thinking. And it's swallowing your fucking ego. It's just, yeah. just you put know, it in your just, back pocket. That's it. And just saying, okay, you know, yeah. I'm... What would I rather do? Would I rather fucking be playing music? At least I'm playing music. At least I'm, it's like bands, musicians who fucking don't want to do corporate gigs yeah. or whatever. Fine, but 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 Get at over some yourself. but at some point, at some point, you know what what what's preferable? Playing a wedding or playing a corporate gig? Three songs and making fifteen hundred two grand, which is what fucking seems to be the going rate these yes, days. Yes. It's just a night, a lazy afternoon's work, or or fucking what going and selling fucking two packs of mud at three o'clock in the morning to come to a fucking half bait. You know? You know, I'll go back to Puffed Off. I I worked out how to sell an underground sound to them without even giving them an underground sound, you know? You give them what they want. You do you do have to think about that. I I I I would be terribly embarrassed sometimes when some of these DJs would come in and I'm talking like all sorts of really cool DJs would visit that club because Survivor was downstairs which was a kind of deep, sleazy techno sound. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, only the cream and the serious DJs would all come in and they'd all pop up because Puftuf was an amazing party. And in one of the most rewarding gigs, residencies, well, the most rewarding, apart from my own venues mm -hmm. back in the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. Extraordinary. In fact, it reminded me a lot of Tasty. It's just that when... when it, <clears throat> It was so it burned so brightly at the bottom end that it kind of petered out a little bit, and um, we lost our way a little bit. And then it moved to the bigger premises, Ch at Chases, which is also a fantastic venue and location. But when with the size, it, the music got more electro, more wetter. Mm -hmm. But now it's gone back to techno. Levi's been in there apparently. I haven't. I don't know. This is just what I hear. Who's mm -hmm. been bringing it back to some quality? But um, I think my point was going to be. Um, oh. <laughs> don't do drugs, kids. What? Don't do drugs. Oh, don't do them. I, I, I lead by example. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do that. I, sometimes I had, I had a meeting with a lawyer quite a few years ago, solicitor, and I'd be talking. And I'd just, His initials weren't MB, were they? No. Nah. Okay. <laughs> and I would just forget. I'd completely forget what we were even talking about. Mm. Anyway. Do you, actually, speaking of MB, I mentioned his name because I just love the fuck out of him. Have you seen or heard from Neil Brown? Neil Brown, I spoke to him, ooh, well, you see, two years ago we did the 20th anniversary of the Tasty Raid. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to Neil prior to that because Neil, wonderful man, he, he requires um, a personal, the personal touch. Yeah. And so I rang him up to invite him along to see if, if, if I could organise an Uber you know, things like that. But he said, oh, God, but I'm far too old. He's the most intelligent human being I've ever known. He's a beautiful man. I love yeah. it. I, uh, I'll never forget the first time I met him, which was at, uh, at fucking Razor. Yeah. Uh, and it was a fucking, it was like, I don't know, six, six in the morning. And there's this bloke who was spoke very eloquently and uh, loved, just obviously loved music. And I was just taken aback by, here's this guy who was a little older than me, just enjoying fucking music. And a little getting, older. <laughs> he, he was like way older than the rest of us. Well, he was way older than the rest of us. I'm just trying to be fucking polite. No, but, it's all right. But no. I, I, I see in in my anti ageism quest. You know, that's why I brought that up. He was he was way older than us, and he came out as a gay man very late in life, in his sixties, and that's when we all met him. And he would um, he used to be a minister in the Fraser government in the seventies. That's right. And was a QC. So, well, he is. He's still hmm. still alive, still fabulous. Yeah. But, um, What's he doing? I think he's doing intellectual, I think he's doing internet now, intellectual property and shit like that from last I heard. Probably. He's, he's yeah. an exceptional brain. Yeah. Totally. But, um, when, when he came into our lives, because mm. he helped us with a case, we got locked out of a club, Temple, in the city, mm. because of 
what they called postcode 3000, which was the the um, apartment boom, residential boom in the in the CBD in the early 90s, mm -hmm. and that's why we got locked out of Temple and Tasty then had to move to where it became very famous. Mm -hmm. But Neil, we went into arbitration on a Monday morning to, and, and Neil, Neil actually, th that case is in the books because it, it's a, you know. Look, set a precedent, didn't it? Set a precedent. Yeah. And I remember um, that's how fine he was. Yeah, no, he was amazing. I, I, I gather he still is. I'll have to try and track him down one of these days. Cause, well, I know how to get in touch with him. Yeah, well, uh, please do, because I'd love to re, <coughs> uh, reconnect with him. And uh, cause we, we used to have some really nice lunches and, uh, he was just a fascinating guy. Well, yeah, he 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 knew a lot, and and also, yeah, he he was <laughs> he was a late bloomer, shall we say? Yeah. <laughs> and and um, with such um, culture about him, it was a pleasure to to be in that state with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. <laughs> what are we saying, no. Tony? <laughs> what, what what do you mean? What we're saying? We're just saying. No, 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 we're no, just no, saying just, what we're saying, yeah, mate. No, no. <laughs> You know, I don't think we said anything. Neil's what you you worried about getting a riff or something? No, no, no. <laughs> oh no, he would never do that. But I just, um, I'm 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 putting Neil on a pedestal here. Yeah. That's no, but I'm you doing. know, yeah. I, I, but but I think Neil's one of those guys who um, probably deserves a little bit of that because he's he's such a self assuring yeah. guy yeah. and uh, he's humble and he's um, he's remarkable achievement. Actually, you know what? He, I've only read in my whole fucking life, Gavin Campbell, maybe. Twelve books from mm -hmm. cover to cover. One of them was his. His book. His book. I was. I. Was, I just felt compelled to. Now, mind you, it took me about five months, which equates to roughly, I don't know, two hundred shits. <laughs> right. So it was two hundred shits approximately of fucking. <laughs> but I got through it. You're fantastic. <laughs> well, you know, I, 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 I've read less books than that. Oh, okay. I've got two Prince books on, on the go at the moment. Okay. I was, re I was reading this book, Prince, months before he passed away, and because right. and, uh, I've been a Prince fanatic mm. ever since 1980. Mm. Anyway, so I'm reading this big, thick thing, and it's an amazing book. And when I got to the Purple Rain bit, I thought, I'm going to go and get the Purple Rain book now. So I'm immersed in 1984, Prince. Best year of music, in my moment. opinion. One of my Fantastic. favourite years of music, yeah. And you want to know something interesting about that? 84 comes obviously just after 83, but no, but, <laughs> no, but please don't it, tell me it, it's it, true. <laughs> it was, it was a year that just kind of an anomaly, yeah. another anomaly just popped up mm. where that period from 1979 to about 82, 83, I feel is the most important era in music. It was when, um, in the UK and Europe, it was the age of the independence, yeah, and suddenly creativity. Yeah. And um, independence. And technology too. And right? technology. So the music, everything changed then. The majors weren't in charge anymore. And, and, and the post punk era and extraordinary level of um, intellect and creativity in music. And then, then you get 1984. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Just to like, <sighs> yeah. So um, fabulous. There you go. That was a beautiful thing. I'm just, are we finished? We're just about there. For now. How long have we got? Well, a couple of minutes. Oh, God. How am I going to get him what I want to say? Well, well no, you got, no, you got, I'll, give, I'll give you more. No, I, I don't know what I want to say. What do I want to say? There, well, is there anything else that you want to share about? Is there anything else you want to share about Treaty? I mean, when... Because well, there's a 25th, a 25th anniversary package. Package? We've got... Yeah. I, I've been waiting for this to come along for a while. Knowing that... Um, well, in the last few years... The, the cool young DJs that I've met, the one, the movers and shakers, they all tell me when they find out I did treaty, they're like, oh, wow, I play that often. And I always thought they were bullshitting me, mm. just being polite. Yeah. But they have been playing it. Yeah. It's big at festivals. It's bigger now than it ever was. And it's a bit of a cult thing amongst the cool set. And um, so I'm like, oh, wow. And they were, they were talking to me before we all realised that other yeah. connection, which was um, nice to... Nice to be aware of, yeah. but um, now we've I've got there's seven remixes in the in the making. I'm just preparing the stems for all the producers and, and an agreement for them all to sign because it's culturally extremely sensitive. Yeah, and I look, we've got some of the biggest names. I'm going to say, and then what we'll do is because it's at the end of the interview, we'll cut it if I'm not allowed to let you air this mm -hmm. prior to the agreements being signed. But I've got the avalanches and. People like that, wow. re remixing treaty, 
and you know they're they're the big story of the year in in Australian music and I this isn't my ego or anything but I think Treaties the other part to the to mm -hmm. the big release for the year mm -hmm. and that's just one one of the remixes I've got a whole bunch you're gonna do it you're gonna do vinyl as well as uh, I'm, get, yeah. I'm what I'm gonna do is. So is this so this is your label putting it out or your is this just something that you're coordinating I've with licensed Mushroom? it. It's coming right. out on Razor. Right. Because right. it is a Razor thing anyway. Yeah. I, I created Treaty for the sole purpose for Razor Records back in nineteen ninety to be able to be self sufficient within mm. the mushroom group. Mm. Because bless them, but Gadinsky and the rest of them just didn't understand dance music, which is why they sucked me into their world. Mm. And um, the money was drying up within the company for me to do things, and I had a box of cassettes mm. that was sent to me from all over the country, and I'm like, how do I do this? Mm. So uh, I realised that this was a smart move to do something with Treaty. And um, so it was a razor release, and my label has been reborn again purely to help bring my profile up mm -hmm. so the phone can ring, because mm -hmm. I haven't done... I don't do anything else, really. Yeah. I haven't done anything else. I was so successful as a DJ for years mm. that there was... And then all of a sudden, I'm like, where am I? I'm a DJ and I've got no, no fucking gigs. <laughs> so, <laughs> although I'm, I think I'm better now than I ever was yeah. as, as a DJ. So I've been thinking Treaty's going to help, Treaty's going to help, blah, blah, blah. And Well, not Treaty, the label mm. and whatever ha happens then Treaty was coming along. So it's it's a fine thing. And I, I I must say, I've been grappling, really grappling with, because this particular release, at the moment, it's Yothi Indy and Gavin Campbell, yeah. um, Treaty 16. And sometimes I think, should my name be on it? But I think, yeah, I need, to, I need the gigs. I so need, I need... As opposed to Filthy Luca, or...? Well, it's just me this time. Right, okay, yeah. You know, and it's all new. We are celebrating the Filthy Luca remix, and I am, I'm actually doing two mixes. My co-producer for the two mixes I'm doing is Nick Coleman. Mm -hmm. And Nick... How is Nick these days? He's great. He's been in LA for quite a few months. Oh, good on him. Um, he, I think he's doing some pop music. Oh, wow. Yeah, he's a, he's a lovely man. And so I can't wait for him to get back and, and we can actually start work because, you know, it's, it's got to be done. But um, Nick and I are going to update the track. Just do a, an update. Just to freshen it up a little bit. Freshen it up. We're not really using the old stems because they're lost. Mm. I know, it's, it's weird, isn't it? They're mm. lost. But um, we're, we're going to focus on the dub and, and sample it. <laughs> I have to sample it. I don't know if I should be saying all this. But, um, and then I want to do like this long techno dub. Mm. I want, uh, yeah, I, I, like a haunting in the bush. Mm. I want, um, I've been saying to people, a bit like, Imagine a scene from Skippy. Someone's on acid and they're running and they keep falling over and getting up and everything's whizzing and that's the breakdown. And they get up and it's like, they start running and that's the beat kicking in. Do you know what I mean? Like this wild ethereal ceremony. Are you going to have... Oh, you got maybe not. Maybe not that. You might I'm, go that far. I'm toying with the idea of some of those like... <laughs> noises. But, yeah. but maybe um, juxtaposing some... Technology, some word. synthetic sounds, isn't it a great Juxtapose. Word? Juxtaposing some organic, natural bush sounds with some synthesizers, and, and, but swap them over. So the, the function, the synthesizers is doing the bird or whatever, and, mm -hmm. and the bird is, is looped to, and not even, a, people wouldn't even be aware of it, you know, that type of thing. Yeah, I think yeah, it'd yeah. be great to, to fuse it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see Treaty as a fusion. Yeah. And so, but, but this particular pack, it, it, I'm going to change some of my names now. Where um, there's an, a man named Pip Norman that's done a couple of things already for the label, and he's he he had a name, uh, a hip hop production moniker, Count Bounce, and he's won Arias and everything. And mm -hmm. Troy Savan's been huge overseas. Yeah. Thanks to Pip. By the way, that wasn't me. That was a dog. Just in case you know. Did you fart? No, that was a dog. <laughs> that was a dog. I was. I'm so busy talking. I couldn't smell <laughs> so, anything. So, but um. So Pip's going to do a hip-hop version. Oh, wow. With, um, he wants Briggs and Earthboy rapping. Briggs would be awesome. I yeah. can imagine those yeah. two, white guy, black guy, beautiful. The protest is back in the song. Yeah. We took it out years ago because we wanted a celebratory, you know, thing. Mm. Nothing too didactic. And we had the video edited to take Bob Hawke and the placards out. Mm. 
I, I was down at, um, at the front of the um, Flinders Street the other day, just happened to end up in the middle of the circle at the protest, mm -hmm. the march, mm -hmm. and I just got my camera doing this, and there's yeah. a treaty, treaty! Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. So, uh, my life's all about treaty and... and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sticking to the man. Yeah, I, I think I was finished saying what I was saying. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> well, Gavin, fucking... <laughs> Mate, so good to see you after all this time. We, yeah, no. we, we won't be another fucking 20 years before we see each other again. No, no. And well, we'll see each other at the launch of Treaty. Yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there 100%. 100%. Fuck, it was just nice to catch up, bro. Yeah. It really was. It's good talking. I I've, I enjoyed that. There wasn't any bits when I thought, gee, I'm sounding a bit or boring. No. I didn't bore myself today. No. You were good too. Oh, well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But it's beautiful, man. It's just beautiful to see, you know, our pe people in our group. I mean, when I catch up with people doing this podcast and see, we've all grown up, mate. Yeah. We've all grown up. Yeah. And and in a, in a, in a good way of growing in up. In a great way. And and it just, there's more cohesion, more inclusiveness, more love, if you will. It's it's lovely to see. Camaraderie. Absolutely, 100%. It's it's, it's great. And, and, and it's just one of the reasons I want to do this podcast, mate, is, is it's, it's about connecting to that, to, to do something for the industry, to, 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 to bring a voice to people and, and to fucking help kids, man. It's to, it's to give kids some inspiration about, you know, particularly those artistic, creative kids who want to fucking get on with life who, so they don't be afraid about going out there, being themselves, chasing it is what they want. And, and hearing stories of people like yourself mm -hmm. to say, listen, this is all fucking doable. And you know what? To be perfectly honest, it's not why we did it, but gee, it's good to know that we can actually help that. Totally. You know, like, um, as in, shine some sort of, some sort of um, awareness, you know, so for them to step into, mm -hmm. or you know, yeah. find, find, yeah, and, no, it's cool. And, and Thank I think, you. and I, that's a pleasure. And I think it's another way we can leave a legacy. I mean, you've left a legacy with your label and your remixes and the clubs that you've done. But I think also, you know, if we can help these kids fucking get on to to do great things, so that they in turn can do good things for other people, I think that's a beautiful way of leaving a legacy as well. Yeah, yeah, yes, it's cool. Thank you. Thank you, mate. Thank and you. I fucking love the fuck out of you, man. <laughs> Listen, mate, handshaking is for poofters and homosexuals, okay? <laughs> not, there's, not there's anything wrong with that. There's no poofters here. <laughs> you know I was made an honorary queen in 1994. Well, yeah, Neil Brown's place. Oh, One, cool. Uh, we were going out. It was, it was a little pre-party before fucking winter days. And, and all the queens just loved me. And they just, oh, I can't believe this guy. Did you have to put out? Uh, no, 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 no. I, 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 I had the golden, I had the golden card, but not to say there weren't any attempts, but nonetheless. But no, they, they love bears like you. They do, they do. Although there's less of me these days than it was then. But no, but I was made an honorary queen. I said, look at this guy. We should be much more. Why can't more straights be like you? Yeah, you know? I, I actually can relate to that because the lesbians at the same time made me an honorary lo a dyke. <laughs> they did. They're a great dyke. Well, I'm a lesbian trapped in a man's body, Gordon Campbell. <laughs> I'm here to tell you. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Keep no, up the good work. I love the podcast. Oh, uh, thanks, mate. I want to go home and watch the Briggs one. Oh, uh, Briggs. The Briggs one's fucking awesome. Yeah. It, 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 I can't wait to meet him. I like that guy. Thirty years of age. For what he's achieved. To, up until now, Brilliant. and if you fucking Brilliant. listen to his humility and his work ethic, mm. and and just how how straight his head is, even with about the whole thing of racism, he's 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 just smart enough to know. Look, I can sit here and get angry like everyone else, and with all the justification in the world, yeah. but he's decided. You know what? I'm going to fucking do something positive. I'm going to do something. I'm going to fucking do things in a more constructive fashion with more what? Power to I, him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And. And I love him, and um, he's he's awesome. So anyway, thank you very much, thank Gavin you. Campbell. Thank you for watching and thank listening. Thank you for watching. And um, as I always uh, sign off, I like to say, please, everyone, be nice to each other, but more importantly, be nice to yourselves. I love you, fuckers. See you later. So. And there you go, Gavin Campbell. That, that was is, all right. That more than all right. Did it you was, like that? I loved it. What do you mean? It was <laughs> it was exactly as I anticipated. It was just this is why I don't fucking bother with all this fucking. You know, um, scripting and questions and... I oh, know, I really liked that.